the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Welcome back to the Paracast. With Gene and Chris, we have a fascinating episode this week about a fascinating book written by a fascinating character, James Carrion. It's called The Rosetta Deception. And we'll tell you what that means later on, okay? It's not Rosetta as in what Apple used to translate code for old power PC apps. It's not the Rosetta Stone. It's not the company that sells you kits on how to learn Spanish or French or something. It's something far more encompassing. We'll get to that later. So last week, I don't know, Chris, if we broke our spell, we had several really great guests. Last week, Olaf Phillips presented to me as an expert on conspiracy theories. And I thought, frankly, you know more about some of the subjects he dealt with than he did. That's my job, Gene. <laughs> but we bring on guests for their expertise, not to show how smart we are. Well, yeah. Again, I've, I've always kind of made it my goal to ask a question of our guests that they don't know the answer to, and then supply them in the an- with the answer, and then have them thank me. That's every show. That's my goal. So, you know, I, I rarely attain that goal, but yeah, Olaf. Uh, I think he seemed a little nervous. I, I don't think he's really that experienced with doing shows uh, such as the Paracast. I think um, you know the majority of shows and podcasts out there suspend their disbelief and sit back and just kind of let the guests sort of hold sway over the uh, entire conversation. Of course, we uh, attempt to ask probing questions, and oftentimes we uh, we do. And, uh, well, most times, I should say. And I think Olaf seemed a little hesitant to really get into some areas and also uh, didn't seem as up to speed as I, as I assumed he would be. I mean, he's involved in this organization that puts out radio shows and everything, so he has to be experienced with that. He's been on the major shows, but as you say, a lot of radio shows just bring on people like that and they pander to their audience and they let these people say nonsensical things and they don't probe, they don't ask logical questions, take a conclusion to its its ultimate answer, where it might lead. And I thought, as I said, that he really had the surface information that anybody can get reading a few books or going on the internet. And I guess he's done well with that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not enough. sure how many books he's read, but you could tell he definitely had a, a, quite a bit of internet, uh, I think, uh, based knowledge. But when you get into the kinds of subject matters that, that he's uh, diving into, you really need to do your homework and you need to read a lot. And that that's a problem, I think, that we're seeing uh, every year I just get a sense more and more that people are relying too much on the internet and not really doing the, uh, the heavy lifting, the deep digging into reading the kinds of books and supplemental material that really give you more of a inside, uh, track and, and, and a width and breadth of knowledge that you just can't find on the internet with many of these subjects. It doesn't hurt to do some on-site investigation when you have the opportunity, but even then you've got to learn what you're doing. You don't just walk into a place and ask questions. You've got to know yeah. what to ask, how to ask it. And that's not something that you learn very easily. It requires practice and training to know what you're doing. No. Well, <laughs> boy, we could do a whole show just on that subject. We've done a few about investigators' kits and stuff like that. But yeah. this is a very important point. Anyway, the show's out there. Make of it what you will. I don't think it's our best, but I certainly think we tried. Yeah. And we gave him a fair chance to... Yeah present his point of view. Now, we still have that wacky thread on the Paracast forums entitled Ryan Skinner, Skinwalker Ranch. Of course, Ryan was on the show several times talking about his couple of books on Skinwalker Ranch, and that's erupted into a major debate (laughs) in our forums at forum.theparacast.com. Having a hard time keeping up with it. Oh, boy. You know, sometimes these topics or threads take on a life of their own. Mm-hmm. And lots of people get involved, surprising people get involved. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm really not sure what to make of it. I, I, I think our, our new poster, Dissection uh, Stalker, I think his name is, uh, his avatar name is, uh, he's yes. brought up some very interesting points. 
I think he's pointed out uh, some very interesting things uh, concerning the possibility of military and government involvement at the Sherman Ranch or the Skinwalker Ranch, if you will, and that many of these types of of stories that have have been told, uh, you know, either in Hunt for the Skinwalker, of course, the Knapp and Kelleher book, uh, and uh, it, Ryan's uh, experiences up there. A lot of these uh, are apocryphal. They they tend to be purely anecdotal in nature. Uh, there does appear on some level to be some sleight of hand going on. There are some questions about what was going on uh, at the ranch and in that area prior to Terry Sherman and Gwen Sherman uh, acquiring the ranch. Of course, Frank Salisbury, who we had on the show a couple of years back, insists that there was really nothing going on. Uh, his protege, Junior Hicks, uh, has made some statements that uh, dissection stalker has taken exception to. And he's, he's, he is bringing up some, some good points. I think he's, he's badgering people a little too much. I think he's, uh, his tone uh, lacks uh, the kind of gravitas and respect that most posters on the Fer- uh, Paracast forum uh, use. And, you know, I do have a little bit of a of an issue with the quality and method of delivery that he's using. But he is bringing up some very, very salient points. And I think uh, many of these points, I think, are worthy of further investigation and are worthy of uh, some some serious uh, consideration. I, I do. Well, I think perhaps, as you say, he could sell it better. If he just calms down, try to be more respectful, get his points across, I think people will pay more attention. Because, you know, if you start attacking somebody, you jump in on the attack, people get up their hackles. Yeah. They get resentful. And that doesn't solve anything. We also yeah. were visited, by the way, by a famous <laughs> UFO paranormal skeptic james oberg he dropped in for a couple of messages and i'd like to get him on the show so we'll see i knew him casually years ago so let's see what happens yeah that would be fun james oberg you're listening james let's get you on the show speaking of someone who is also taking a skeptical approach to a lot of these subjects now james carrion was the former director of mufon left under not very pleasant terms, which he described in his previous appearance on the show. And he's come up with this book called The Rosetta Deception. And it goes back to a program that apparently existed during World War II and after, involving basically disinformation, impacting the Cold War, impacting Joseph Stalin, who he calls Uncle Joe. Rather interesting. But it also creates some fascinating possibilities about the early start of the UFO field. Now, the book does cover ghost rockets, but it also leaves open lots of possibilities I want to get into with James when we get him on the show. And the first is, of course, the fact that one of the members of this Rosetta group famously is very well known in intelligence circles, but in civilian life... Now, I'm not going to mention his name yet. I will when we get into the episode. In civilian life, he became part of the investigation into UFOs. And you have to wonder about the implications here. This book is a bit dry. It's not something that you can read in one setting. You've got to sit back and digest all the information. Chris and I did it, so we know. We've gone through it. We've read this book from cover to cover. <laughs> It has a lot of implications, and it's really only a start. Yeah. Some great research, though. Really, he, he really pulled out all the stops when he, when he gathered together all this information. Uh, my hat's off to him. An amazing amount of research. And go get a copy of the book. It's called The Rosetta Deception. You can get it on Amazon. The author is James Carrion, and he's coming up next. So sit back and listen to this. This is one tremendous piece of work. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. 
This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the Coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R O C K O I D S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. Hi, my Mike Penz with Midas Resources Incorporated, senior monetary specialist. With foreign countries going bankrupt and states within the United States going bankrupt, not to mention all the Ponzi schemes in the marketplace, do you think your money and investments are safe? Of course not. Call me, Mike Penz, 1-800-686-2237, extension 181. I can help answer any questions you have about protecting your money, whether it be personal possession or holding precious metals in an IRA. Gold carries a 6,000-year history that is the only real and lasting money in the world. Paper currencies have come and gone. On. Governments have toppled. The world map has changed many times, and yet gold still thrives in almost every country. Gold is the ultimate store of wealth. Central banks continue to maintain reserves of gold. Common sense begs the question, why? Let me help you answer that question. Call me, Mike Pens, 1-800-686-2237, extension 181. Call now, and I will send you free information on precious metals. Call Mike Pens, 1-800-686-2237, extension 181. At 30dayfoodsupply.com, you can now purchase a one-of-a-kind product not available anywhere else. A meatless burger dry mix in four delicious flavors. With our new Oregon Trail Foods vegan burgers, all you do is add water and fry. They need no refrigeration. They're packaged in Mylar bags with an oxygen absorber for a long shelf life. They're non-GMO. They're gluten, soy, nut, and chemical-free, but they're loaded with flavor. And a good source of carbs and protein, yet low in sodium. Flavors include Italian, spicy Mexican, six vegetable and black bean olive go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010 and order today eat them every day take them camping or save them for an emergency check them out at 30dayfoodsupply.com and click on the vegan burger icon that's 30dayfoodsupply.com where all of our products are produced in oregon by oregon trail foods 30dayfoodsupply.com have you ever noticed how many sick and miserable people there are? I'm serious. I'm talking about people of all ages who have conditions and diseases which affect their quality of life. Most of them seem to have one thing in common, polypharmacy. That is dependence on multiple prescription drugs with side effects that actually make them sicker and sicker, not healthy. The good news is that people are waking up to the fact that if you supply your body with all of the nutrients it requires, you will feel better, be healthier, and have a better life. It's important to know that Beyond Tangy Tangerine is the the most amazing, great-tasting, comprehensive nutritional supplement. Besides supplying all the vitamins our bodies need, it also supplies the necessary minerals that are required for the vitamins to kick in. Look, folks, I'm hooked on it, and I think if you try it, you'll become hooked. This stuff really works. That's why I'm urging you to make it part of your daily health regimen. Visit InfoWarsTeam.com to secure your canister of Beyond Tangy Tangerine today. Sign up for auto ship and save on shipping costs. That's Beyond Tangy Tangerine at InfoWarsTeam.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. The book is called The Rosetta Deception. The author is James Carrion. And as I say, it's a tremendous piece of research a tremendous amount of work went into this book. But it's not something that is something you just read like a novel. you got to sit down, read, pay attention, a lot of information. James, welcome back to the Paracast. So I think we need to go back in time to talk about your background first before we get into this book. Now, before you were a director of MUFON, you had a military intelligence background, didn't you? That's correct. Uh, well, it was a very short uh, time in the military. I spent four years as a signals intelligence analyst slash Russian linguist during my early 20s. Uh, so I joined the military right out of high school. And for the four years I was in the Army, uh, I essentially worked on behalf of the NSA. 
that place. So it's not just a bunch of nerds and cubicles. Not at all. And actually, we were the military is more the gophers of the NSA. They're the ones that uh, intercept and gather the low level intelligence that then gets sent back to uh, Fort Meade, where it's all aggregated and analyzed. Now, you mentioned here being a Russian linguist. So you speak fluent Russian. No, I wouldn't say that. I, I went to language school for a year out in Monterey, California. Uh, it was a very intensive language uh, uh, class, and uh, I learned how to read it, and uh, I learned the basics of it, but I, I definitely don't call myself fluent. Okay, you didn't use Rosetta as your language training. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. All right. So what attracted you to this subject? Because it's not something that you just do casually. You had to do a tremendous amount of research to put this together. What got you involved in this? Well, you know, actually, I find it uh, fairly fascinating, the synchronicity uh, of my whole journey, uh, because it actually started when I was in childhood. When I was, I guess, around the age of 11, I spent a lot of time clipping newspaper articles out of tabloids about aliens and UFOs, all these tabloid publications my mom would subscribe to. So it's it's ironic in a way that I started off my interest uh, with the media and how the media covered it, uh, only to much later, as, as I show in the book, uh, that uh, the intelligence agency use, uh, agencies use the same media to uh, to push out their deception. Okay, so where did you first see evidence that a deception existed? I would have to say, uh, during the time I was in MUFON, you know, when I first joined the organization, just like everybody else, I was very curious. I wanted to know why this subject was still a mystery. Uh, and the more I started to look into it, the more I started to research it, and the higher that I got up in the organization, the more I could see that there was a large element of human deception involved. Um, a lot of the cases, for example, that I investigated personally during MUFON, uh, there was no uh, paranormal, there was no uh, extraterrestrial aspect to a lot of these cases. A lot of it boiled down to, uh, you know, strange people uh, passing strange stories and of questionable backgrounds and really trying to spin the whole rumor mill uh, around the subject. Can you give us one or two examples of the strange people? doing the spin or the spin control? Sure. Well, there are quite a few examples. Uh, when I joined MUFON's board, there was a gentleman who claimed uh, that he was um, had substantial financial resources. He wanted to help MUFON out. Uh, and he kept spinning the story to the MUFON board how he was going to contribute vast amounts of money. Uh, and it never materialized. The guy would you know, say, OK, I'm going to set up this sort of project. I'm going to fund at this level. I'm going to send you this check. Never happened. So characters like this is sort of just came in, came out. And, uh, you know, they really never panned out. Or it could be, for example... Um, let's take, for example, one of the, uh, one of the MUFON conferences back, I think it was in, um, 2007, uh, where we had this gentleman who, who, who came to, to the symposium to speak. And he, he actually had this very elaborate tale of how he was, uh, a sheriff's deputy, uh, for a famous, in, in an area where they had a famous UFO case. And he wrote this elaborate uh, investigation that he did, and it all turned out to be just complete lies. So we get a lot of these strange characters that just pop into the to the UFO field. They make these grandiose claims, and and none of it which really pans out. And sometimes they just up and disappear, don't they? Exactly. We never hear from them again. We never see from them see them again. All right. Now this is fascinating. This is really fascinating how this works. Would you care to name the person who was at that MUFON conference? You know, actually, I don't really want to because I, I think after I left MUFON, I'll be honest, I, I really try to distance myself as much as possible from the UFO field uh, because what I found found is that a lot of the infighting that happens within ufology of people pointing fingers and and basically calling each other names and, and my my evidence is more important than your evidence or this person's, you know, spinning a story and lying, but I'm telling the truth. All of this infighting, uh, all it really does is it just creates and muddies the water even more than they already are. Divide so rather than speak, and conquer. 
Exactly. It's all about divide and conquer. So I really, when, when I left MUFON, I thought, you know what? I really, this is not going to be an issue of persona. It's not going to be about people. It's really going to be about evidence. What can I do and what can I dig up and what can I research that's pure evidence? It has nothing to do with eyewitness testimony. It has nothing to do with purported claims that can't be substantiated. I really wanted to go out there and document in a very methodical and uh, thorough way the actual research that I did. It has nothing to do with people themselves. Now, how does this lead us to the Rosetta Deception? Well, this is, um, you know, actually, I I started off uh, wanting to write a book uh, about the early days of UFOs in 1947, specifically around Maury Island, around Kenneth Arnold, around Roswell. Because to me, those are the, those three cases that have that all came in such a concentrated period of time in 1947. Uh, I have a feeling, or more than a feeling, I, I think there's evidence to show that uh, there is there is government deception that is a thread that runs through those three cases. But before I could get started with that. I said, you know, I need to go back a little earlier because, of course, if I come out with a Roswell book, somebody's going to say, well, how about the ghost rockets of 1946? Or how about the pyramids? Or how about this? You know, they always want to point to the evidence that preceded the the modern day uh, UFO era. And I thought, you know what, it doesn't hurt to go back an early, a year earlier to 1946 and take a look into that time frame. And what I found was, as I started digging into that time frame, I started finding evidence that simply no one else has bothered to present or, or, or just discarded. And I thought, okay, this is where I'm going to start. I'm going to start, you know, showing precedent. I'm going to start showing that there is a deception thread that started even before uh, the modern day UFO UFO era. Okay, now this is a very complicated story. We're going to go into it now and then look at the natural implications, where this leads to, and how it may interact with the UFO field in some surprising ways. The book, again, is called The Rosetta Deception from James Carrion, and you get a copy over at Amazon. We've got a link over at the Paracast forums and on our site. So if you click on that link, we get, you know, one cent commission or something like that. I don't know. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. Independently leading the way for the nation. Compelling talk for every political persuasion. We are GCN. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of hb extract it's extremely effective and it starts working in just days visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers and we've never increased our price in over 10 years that makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it a healthy heart is a happy heart call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com 
Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV this alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock-bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right. General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right. That's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturers, if you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. So call 866-91-STEEL. Lock in your price now. Call 866-91-STEEL. That's 866-917-8335. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. Okay, this is an involved story, folks. He's looking for maybe something, a specific fact, James Carrion, or something that may be involved with government deception and its interaction with these early UFO cases, ghost rockets, Roswell, Kenneth Arnold. How does that all interact? And I gather here from reading the book, James, this stuff is out there for the most part. It just took someone like you to think of the natural implications and put it all together. Yeah, I think I think what it really takes is not ignoring evidence. Um, I think that in the UFO field, even those folks that are, are considered the most notable and gifted researchers, they have a tendency to ignore evidence. Let's take, for example, the, the alleged uh, you know, L.A. raid that happened, I think it was 1942, uh, where you know, a lot of ufologists will point back to that and say, oh, there was an early UFO even before Kenneth Arnold happened. But they completely ignore that just a few days before that air raid and before we started bombarding the sky with, with uh, projectiles because we thought something was flying over during, during the war years, just two days before that, uh, there were submarines, Japanese submarines, that surfaced off uh, the coast of California and shelled the, the, the harbor. So they, they tend to ignore that because what they want to not show is that there was a reason why these people that were sitting behind these guns, these, these air defense guns, their nerves were so frayed. They already felt like there was going to be an imminent, imminent evasion of the homeland based on these two submarines that popped up and started uh, shelling in California. Of course, they were going to shoot at anything that they perceived as flying over. But, so that, that kind of ignoring the, the circumstances around it, the more mundane aspect of things, and focusing on the sensational and, and on the extraordinary is what really uh, sort of irked me as a researcher. So I thought, you know, I really need to focus on down-to-earth terrestrial explanation for some of these things that were happening. And as I started digging, for example, into the ghost rockets, I, I could see just uh, fact after fact that's been completely ignored by even the most prominent ghost rocket researchers out there. Well, that leads me to a question. Uh, Micah Hanks just released a book uh, about a year, year and a half ago that covers the ghost rockets. And I was actually kind of slack-jawed at some of the information that you were able to come up with that I don't recall seeing in Micah's book uh, in terms of ghost rockets being uh, reported down in the Mediterranean areas, uh, I think around Yugoslavia, Italy, and other places. Uh, this this I was not aware of. 
One thing that I, 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 f- I feel that we should actually even take a step further back and, and look at the, uh, the whole phenomenon of the Foo Fighters. Where do you come down on, on what was going on with the Foo Fighters and, you know, what kind of technology was being developed by the Nazis at the time that we could pin those, those objects uh, that were being seen by flight crews from, you know, both sides of the conflict? Where do you come down on the whole uh, Foo Fighter mystery? You know, I, I wish I could uh, actually offer some words of wisdom on that, but I really can't because I really haven't studied enough about the Foo Fighters uh, or examined any of the hard evidence uh, that surrounds it. And so I have to say that, you know, my knowledge of, of the Foo Fighters in the World War II era is fairly, fairly limited. So I really don't want to, you know, offer an opinion on that that I really can't substantiate. So basically the evidence that you came across and you put together didn't go into the Foo Fighters, they went into the ghost rockets. Correct. Uh, the book starts in, in 1946, right in the post-war era. Now, understand here, I gather Rosetta is the name you gave to this group of people who were involved in this. Correct. Um, and the reason I gave it Rosetta, uh, you'll have to get to the end of the book to really understand why. Uh, but it has to do with uh, my feeling is that the deception operation that took place uh, that involved the ghost rockets, what it really broke down uh, broke down to in terms of motivation was we wanted uh, I would say when we say when I say we I mean the allies the British and the and the Americans they really wanted to break uh, the Russian code the Russian diplomatic code the same way that we broke the German code during the war and the Japanese code during the war uh, that was the main reason behind this group was they were interested in breaking the code and understanding what uh, Joseph Stalin was up to and what he was thinking. Um, and the way they would do that is they would, they would plant uh, information in newspapers that they knew the Russians would be very interested in. And when I talk about newspapers, I mean newspapers here in the United States. Uh, and that would cause the, uh, these Russians to then take some of these newspaper articles and encode them in the code we were trying to break and transmit them back to Moscow, and we were actually collecting, uh, you know, we were siphoning all of the, that encrypted communication up uh, through some relationships we had with the telegraph companies, uh, and then we were able to sort of reverse engineer the code because we had essentially, uh, um, through, uh, I would say, uh, press manipulation and, and, and media manipulation, had planted the text we wanted them to send back in the first place. So in cryptography, again, this is a very complex subject to try to cover in such a short period of time, but in in cryptography, this is called a chosen plain text attack. You effectively, you're the person who wants to break a code, uh, but you cause your enemy to gather information that you've already planted, and you know what that information is, hoping that they will encrypt it. And then you turn around and you know what the plain text is because you're the one that planted it, and you have the encrypted communication from your enemy. And with those two pieces of information, you can back engineer it. Exactly. Now, the way this worked, uh, it's it's fairly complex. It actually surrounds a project called uh, the Venona Project. Uh, And the way that the Russians had uh, encrypted their communication, um, it really boiled down to – to trying to pick out of this encrypted text the low-hanging fruit first. And what this low-hanging fruit happened to be were anglicized names in the, in the encryption. So it could be, for example, that, um, you know, let's say that the Allies planted a, a, a media article that said that President Truman had fallen deathly ill and he's been taken to Bethesda Hospital. Well, at that point, the, the Russians could take that information and take it down to their local telegraph office, encrypt it, and send it back. But in order to put the name Truman in their text, they didn't have a way to do that other than to – so effectively, because they didn't have a way to uh, encrypt the word Truman uh, because it was an anglicized name, it was using Latin characters, they would have to break it up into its individual letter form, T-R-U-M-A-N. And there was a special way they would do that within their encrypted communication that would be the first thing to stick out when you're trying to decrypt it. So effectively, um, the the Americans and the British 
were reverse engineering the, the Russian code in the same way that the French reverse engineered hieroglyphics using the Rosetta Stone because they, they would first attack the um, hieroglyphics uh, by looking at the cartouche characters uh, in the Rosetta Stone, which, which basically was a royal name. So they would focus on that saying, okay, this is obviously a royal name. If we can figure out what this royal name is, then that gives us some clue to what the rest of the text is. So there, that's basically where the, where the, the term Rosetta came from, because we were, we were trying to break the Soviet diplomatic code in the same way that hieroglyphics were, were broken by Napoleon's folks. Now, I understand here in the early days of the Cold War, the Russians had sent spies to this country, infiltrated here. And when you wrote about that, I was thinking about a TV show that you are probably familiar with on the FX network called The Americans. Indeed, it's actually one of my favorite shows, so I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called The Americans on the FX network. One of my favorite shows. So they take two people who are Russian and they turn them into faux Americans. And they actually get married, they have kids, and they have a normal life. They run a travel agency, and by night, they are Soviet spies. They kill people, they do various projects. Meantime, they live in the same neighborhood across the street from the FBI agent, which makes for some interesting stories. It's a fascinating show. I think it's on hiatus now, but when it comes back, the Americans watch it. But you get a sense here. This is based on the reality, and that show takes place in the 80s. But imagine in the 40s and 50s, the Russians are sending spies here, and we want to find out who they are. James Carrion wants to find out, I guess. <laughs> With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Listening to GCN, proudly sponsored by UnseenNow.com. Lock down your digital life at UnseenNow.com. This is GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. I didn't believe it. Neither did I. No way could you professionally remove unwanted hair pain free and at home. My thoughts exactly. Remove my face and body hair without expensive, painful office visits. Not possible. Great minds think alike. Until I tried No No Pro. Mm hmm. Wait, you tried No No? Yes, and it works. I use it on my face, legs, bikini line. We're BFFs, and you didn't tell me about No No? Here, this is my new No No Pro. The most powerful No No made. Custom treatment levels, less hair in less time, perfect for any skin type. Try it. No hair, no pain, no time can consuming expensive office visits? No. No. And no, no. For a limited time, you can try No No Pro risk-free. You'll also get the facial kit and a travel case. Get weeks of long-lasting results. That's it. I'm getting a no, no. Great minds do think alike. <laughs> <laughs> try No No Pro risk-free by calling 800-952-5760. 800-952-5760. That's 800-952-5760. 952 5760 We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years in serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light 
system today, complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231, and the Berkey Guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey Guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey Guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653. Or order online at GoBerkey.com. That's GoBerkey.com today. If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to proflowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's proflowers.com. Click the mic and enter code P-L-O-W. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. So we're painting the picture after World War II, where the Americans are engaged in decoding the Russian messages. Now, parenthetically, I think here that you have the telegraph companies receiving this, communicating with the government, and now you think of the current controversy with the NSA getting information about phone calls from the telecom companies. Is it any different? Not at all. I think what, what you'll see in the, in the book is that uh, the abuses that first happened of uh, basically uh, vacuuming up large amounts of information for national security reasons, but that include private communications from American citizens, was not something new that happened during the modern day era. This goes way back to the 1940s, even during the war and before we even had uh, a censorship code in place uh, because of, of wartime censorship. And in fact, uh, one of the three telegraph companies, uh, RCA, uh, was voluntarily taking all the all this information from I think it was like 1943, and they were voluntarily giving it to uh, the predecessor of of the NSA, uh, so they could try to break the the Russian code during the war. And it just so turns out that the president of RCA was David Sarnoff, who figures heavily into the whole Ghost Rocket controversy. Uh, if you've done any research about ghost rockets, the ghost rocket era, you know that uh, Jimmy Doolittle, General Jimmy Doolittle, along with David Sarnoff, had allegedly went to uh, Sweden to confer about the ghost rockets with the local authorities because they were they were interested in knowing what they were. Uh, and in fact, they already knew what they were. They were part and parcel of this deception. And, and you can see, again, through this precedence of uh, David Sarnoff's very early uh, on relationship with the intelligence agencies in the U.S. Uh, that he was very much involved here. This is nothing unusual. We've learned that a lot of famous people were involved with some sort of intelligence activities during World War II. Absolutely. The actor Douglas Fairbanks was very much involved uh, during the war. He was um, he actually was was the guy who proposed the beach jumper units. And if you're if your listeners don't know what the beach jumpers were, they were a unit that was formed during World War II explicitly to deceive the enemy by basically um, they were simulating large uh, military forces. So this was part of wartime deception. So let's say, for example, we were trying to uh, land on a certain beach. What we would do is we would deploy our troops uh, on ships. But then on another beach nearby, we would send in these beach jumper units that would simulate the landing of large number of troops, when in fact, it may only be a few boats with some sound devices. And while the enemy was rushing over to this other shore to confront these non-existent forces, that our real military forces would land where the enemy was not and attack. So the beach jumper units were very important during the war. That they, they did wartime deception. Even more, even more interesting was the person who was in charge of the beach jumpers was an admiral by the name of Hewitt, 
who happened to be the, also in charge of the flotilla that uh, was in Scandinavia and in the Mediterranean during the whole ghost rocket period. So here we have the guy who was in charge of deception, naval deception during World War II, also showing up uh, coincidentally in the exact time frame and in the exact location where we have the ghost rocket activity happening in 1946. Now, a lot of our listeners who've just joined us are going to say ghost rockets. What were they? So let's encapsulate that to understand where this takes us. Sure. So in, uh, in mid-1946, uh, starting around May, late May, and uh, going into the fall, there were a large number of reports of these strange missiles that were missiles that were flying over Scandinavia. First, well, first happened in Scandinavia, and then it sort of migrated its way down to the Mediterranean area. As the populations were reporting this, they were being reported in the, in the newspapers, and there was this great fear that what these missiles were, were, were actually experiments by Russia with German uh, missile technology. So if you remember, right after the war, we went in, the United States and, and Britain, and we sort of vacuumed up a bunch of German scientists, uh, missile scientists, and we brought them back to America, uh, and that's how we started our whole space program. Well, the Russians did the same thing. They captured a number of, of uh, German missile scientists and, and hauled them off to Russia. But what was thought at the time was that these strange missiles flying over Scandinavia were, in fact, the Russians who had uh, you know, you kept their, the, the German scientists in place in places like Penemunde and other areas around the Baltic. And they were, they were actually testing uh, the latest rocketry, and they were flying them over neutral countries. Right. And, and Pinot Monday, uh, for new listeners, that's uh, the, you know, the location on the Baltic that the, the V2 rocket uh, technology was perfected and, uh, and developed. And that uh, figures prominently in the subterfuge that surrounds the whole uh, wave of ghost rocket sightings, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're talking uh, close to a thousand reports, possibly some of the same, you know, the same sighting event. But we're talking, you know, this is not just a few people reporting a few things. Uh, th this was a fairly large wave of sightings. I think you mentioned in at one point in the book, there was approximately 800, I think, uh, reports that were, were made at, during this time period. Exactly. It was a large number of reports. And what the uh, some folks here in the American government couldn't understand, and these were the folks that obviously were not in on the deception, as well as folks that uh, were part of the American legation um, in, in those Scandinavian countries who were not part of the deception, they couldn't understand why Russia would be experimenting with all this brand new technology over a neutral country where there could be the possibility of a crash and then the compromise of the technology. When there was obviously vast areas in, in, in Russia where, where they could have taken the, the rockets and experimented with them. So at first they thought it was, oh, it was simply intimidation. The Russians are trying to intimidate these neutral countries. And then they were trying to show that they were technologically superior at the same time we were we were basically, you know, exploding our, our 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 bombs at Bikini Atoll. But even for the for those folks that were not in on the deception, but in the intelligence community, this simply didn't add up. Nothing added up for them. And so the more I looked into that, the, and the more I started to research that aspect of it, the more I started to see this threat of deception. And it's very difficult, I think, for folks. Uh, both in the general population as well as in the UFO field, to understand that when deception is perpetrated, it doesn't have to be widespread knowledge. It starts with a very small group of folks who keep it very close to their vests, and they involved very select people to be in on it. And those that are not in on it are simply deceived them as well. So, you know, it's, you know, take, for example, something like Roswell, where you have this all this alleged uh, witness testimony of military folks coming back years later and saying, hey, I saw this body on the ground, or I, you know, I saw the secret cargo being loaded in the plane. If that was in itself a deception operation, and they were not part and parcel of that deception, they were simply peripheral to it, because they guarded the plane, or they happened to be in the right place at the right time, they are as just deceived as anybody else in the general population. Now, interesting, parenthetically, here is the fact that you mentioned that even President Truman wasn't aware of what was going on here. Why? Because, uh, you know, strategic deception, which is what this is really, really boils down to. And, and, and for your listeners who don't understand strategic deception, let me just sort of put it in a nutshell and explain what it is. During World War II, 
um, and this actually originated with the British. The British knew that they were in trouble. They knew that the, the Germans outgunned them and outmanned them. And if they really wanted to win this war, they were going to have to do it through something other than military might. So they were the ones that actually championed and originated a lot of the deception operations that happened during World War II. And they got it down to such an art that they were able to um, basically defeat the enemy with with an inferior force. And, and so th- this is what is called strategic deception today. It's when at a national level, you are choosing to use all of the black arts tools of deception for strategic goals. And back in 1946, which is right after the war, uh, and we are very war wary, wary at the time, when the, the prospect of a new war, hot war emerging because of how belligerent the, the Russians were at the time appeared, we thought, you know what, we're not going to, we're, we're going to actually employ all of these techniques that we learned during the war in peacetime because we're trying to avoid a hot war. And this is where the Cold War originated. And the British were also responsible for some tactical deception, like painting ships with camouflage so that they would blend in with the background so U-boats uh, it would have a harder time picking them up. I mean, they, they, they really got it down to a fine art, creating whole you know, papier-mâché armies, like being staged for an invasion, for instance, that were all just hollow they basically were not uh real tanks real ships uh that sort of thing so they they were pretty far ahead of the curve in this in this regard we have james carry on the book is called the rosetta deception and as you see folks we developed disinformation misdirection to a fine science with gene and chris you're in the paracast that's what we want to ask about in the moment. James Carrion joins us. I'm Gene Steinberg here in the Tech Night Out Live. Great minds think alike. The network for the independent minded. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Springtime is save big time at Herbal Healer Academy. Long-term customers know spring is the time to stock up at HerbalHealer.com. And for new customers, welcome to the web's best place to save on vitamins, minerals, and more. Log on for spring specials, including our 500 parts per million colloidal silver, all sizes on sale. Choose from Herbal Healer's great variety of weight loss products like apple cider vinegar, hoodia and metabolic complex, and pro-metabolic, all on sale now. Also, the anti-parasite intestinal freedom and Warwood Plus complex, plus stevia liquid sweetener and the super enzymes, all on sale for spring at HerbalHealer.com. As always, we offer certificate correspondence courses in natural medicine. Enjoy same-day shipping and free online newsletter. Log on now to HerbalHealer.com and click on Spring Specials to save big with our nation's leader in supplying quality natural medicine and education since 1988, Herbal Healer Academy. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. On the Paracast with Gene and Chris, we have James Carrion, author of The Rosetta Deception. So Chris was talking about 
some of the things being done in World War II. Would you amplify that, James? Absolutely. So, yeah, there were a number of things that the British uh, first did and then the Americans learned to do. Uh, it, it started uh, off with just rumor spreading, but then there were some very uh, physical aspects to it. Uh, uh, for example, they would have um, these rubber inflated tanks in airplanes so they could simulate uh, equipment on the ground on these large airfields or in defensive positions in the desert. And they were just basically rubber dummies. Uh, they even got it to the point where they could drop uh, out these miniature uh, uh, parachutists. Uh, and so from an en the enemy's perspective, uh, they couldn't tell the size of objects descending from the sky. So they saw this whole swarm of parachutes coming down. They thought it was a, a, a basically a whole airborne force coming down. And it essentially, it was just these small uh, dummies that were on small parachutes. And they even had sound effects to them so that when they right. hit the ground, Gunfire. I so love that gunfire and you, you name it they had it to this very very exact science uh and it was very effective all right this is getting more and more fascinating by the moment let's go back to the ghost rockets now the ghost rockets i got the impression here is that we believe they were the russians but uncle joe joseph stalin believed they were american developments or german developments everybody was fooled they actually, I believe, you know, again, I'm not privy to to what the Russians thought back then, but I believe they thought they were British in origin. I think they were they thought that the British were exper experimenting with uh, these rockets and that we're trying to, to put the blame on them. So it's a pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> <laughs> so basically here, we fooled everybody with this stuff or the various organizations involved. It was not just the Americans. It was the British working together. And you mentioned in the book in one passage that a couple of the agents who were used by Ian Fleming to create James Bond were involved. Absolutely. Uh, so there, there were two main characters in the book. One, uh, his last name is Dunderdale. He, he was a British uh, in British intelligence. Uh, he has uh, a, had a long history of very productive work in, in, in the British in intelligence agency, going all the way back to... Uh, being the ones who who provided to the to the to the um, to the British uh, some captured Enigma machines, uh, he worked very closely with the French, and he was uh, one of the characters that Fleming uh, based his John, James Bond character on. The other one was William Stevenson, and he actually plays a more prominent role in the book uh, because it was his organization uh, known as British Security Coordination. Uh, out of New York City, that actually documented uh, in a book all of the different black art black arts methods they used during the war, from everything from uh, manipulation of the media to rumor spreading to um, you know outright uh, uh, you know uh, using uh, agents to to entice other uh, certain men because they were using a lot of female agents, so they used sex as a tool. Uh, to doing all kinds of very interesting and nasty things that you would expect from a modern-day CIA. In fact, William Stevenson was the one that encouraged the for formation of the OSS, and it was a lot of his techniques that he uh, fine-tuned in his organization that influenced in a large way uh, how the early intelligence, American intelligence organizations, uh, started to do their jobs and, you know, even influencing the modern-day CIA. Well, you know, that brings up a very interesting, uh, a sizable chunk of your book is spent on looking at the machinations that were occurring prior to the uh, 1947, you know, establishment of, uh, you know, what is now, uh, I guess, referred to as the American intelligence uh, complex. And uh, I find it really fascinating going through and seeing how different groups were jockeying for power and for influence prior to, you know, the dissolving of the OSS and the, crea the creation of, of uh, the CIA and what we now know as the modern in intelligence apparatus in this country. Why don't you give us a kind of a thumbnail sketch on some of the ins and outs that were going on and, and how certain groups were jockeying for power? Sure. So, so right after World War II, Truman decided to dissolve uh, a few of the wartime agencies, and one of them happened to be the OSS. So that he called for the disbandment of the the OSS, which was our essentially our intelligence agency during the war. 
and uh, but there were, of course, the intelligence divisions of the, of the various military agencies as well. So there were all these groups in Washington, and they were all thinking, hmm, you know, how can I get my agency to become the foremost intelligence organization in the United States. So, you know, we have the military intelligence uh, organizations like Naval Intelligence and, and Military Intelligence Division, all jockeying for position. Of course, the Air Force hadn't been formed at that point. It wasn't formed until 1947. Uh, but then you have remnants of the OSS that uh, were also very interested in, in maintaining, you know, a, a piece of the pie. So what ended up happening is that before the formation of the Central Intelligence Agency in 1947, there was essentially a stewardship uh, group that consisted of what was called the National Intelligence Authority and the Central Intelligence Group. So the CIG, the Central Intelligence Group, was the predecessor organization to the CIA, and it sort of became the steward for intelligence operations. But during that whole period, from 19, at the, you know, when the war ended, all the way until the CIA was formally started up, there was a lot of jockeying for position from among all aspects of, the, of, of American intelligence to try to figure out you know, how they can come out on top. I also notice here it's what always happens is you have different agencies who are probably vying with one another to gain control. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, there was there was an absolute absolutely a lot of collusion that was going on, and there were some some major figureheads that surrounded that. Uh, yeah, one of the like J Edgar Hoover trying to extend his influence and power. Absolutely. J. Edgar Hoover was there, you know, all, you know, the whole time, you know, obviously he had uh, formed the FBI much early on. He was very active uh, in domestic security, obviously, during the war. But one of the, th the things that a lot of folks don't know is that during World War II, the FBI also extended their fiefdom all the way down into Central America, uh, South America. So they were responsible for intelligence gathering outside of the United States uh, in the South American countries. And when the Central Intelligence Group came into being, and subsequently the CIA, uh, General Vandenberg said, you know what, we're going to wrestle that away from, from J. Edgar Hoover, managed to convince the president of that, and ended up, uh, you know, basically taking over all of the intelligence operations in South America away from the FBI. And, and J. Edgar Hoover being the very cantankerous and very uh, strong-willed person that he was, uh, and, and a very ill-tempered. Uh, when his FBI agents left South America, it was basically a, 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 a burn operation. They said, we're not going to give the, the Central Intelligence Group any of our contacts. We're not going to keep any of our records in place. We're taking it all out and let them start from scratch. So rather than be a cooperative uh, operation, it, it, it became a very antagonistic operation. Well, I'd be all mean and cantankerous, too, if I was uh, a cross-dresser and in my private life and not wanting anybody to find that out. And <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, you got to hand it to him. He really did uh, exert a lot of power and influence and had quite a dossier on public figures uh, during that time period and later. Absolutely. This whole thing has really become a fascinating adventure. Let's go back briefly to the ghost rockets. We're going to have to break in about a minute. And that is, all right, you had all these reports of these things in the sky, forgetting what they were interpreted to be, was it all just people reporting fake sightings to the press, misinterpretations, what? No, I don't think so at all. So I think you have to basically compartmentalize the information that was floating around back then. There's the information that was showing up in the media. I'm sure a lot of those sightings were real. What was behind them is, in, and I elaborate this in my book, is that uh, if you can remember again back to these beach jumper units from World War II that, that were trying to convince the enemy that they were a large invasion force, if they could convince in wartime uh, an enemy unit to believe that they're being attacked when they weren't, you could very easily convince during peacetime that there were missiles flying around the sky. Remember, they had all kinds of paraphernalia and devices they could use to simulate that. Mm -hmm. Or saucers crashing at Roswell. That's what we want to ask about in a moment. James Carrion joins us. I'm Gene Steinberg here in the Tech Night Out Live. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. 
Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com that's rockoids r-o-c-k-o-i-d-s dot com have you ever felt like the united states government knows way too much about your financial affairs i continue to hear stories about property seizures frozen bank accounts confiscation of stocks and bonds it makes me wonder if the u.s citizen will ever again have the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional installation. You control what you watch when you watch it. Record your favorite shows, pause and rewind live TV, even skip the commercials. Watch local channels. Channels too. At just $19.99, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1 855 905 My TV. 1 855 905 My TV. Say goodbye to the cable guy. Cut costs and get more. 1 855 905 My TV. 1 855 905 My TV. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of hb extract it's extremely effective and it starts working in just days visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers and we've never increased our price in over 10 years that makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it a healthy heart is a happy heart call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We're back at the Paracast. James Carrion is author of The Rosetta Deception with Gene and Chris. Now, looking at the ghost rockets, so we assume they were all conventional and they leveraged these reports or did they generate these reports to create the disinformation campaign? I think it could have been a variety of things. Um, so, so my feeling is that it was probably a combination of, dis- of actual uh, things that were seen blowing up. You know, it could be very simple um, deception devices, the same, same type that they used during the war. To simulate something flying overhead, it could have been real missiles. I mean, we had an arsenal. A lot of folks don't know this of over a thousand missiles that were like the V1. They were known as the Loon missile, 
and uh, was basically a carbon copy of the V1 rocket. We we had mass manufactured these. We were going to use them in the against the uh, the Japanese during the invasion of of the Japanese homeland, but that was obviated by the dropping of the atomic bomb. So so what do you do with all the uh, all the loons? <laughs> yeah, you you launch them somewhere, maybe over Scandinavia, you know. And I don't think they they, they had to launch a large number of these. I think it had to be just a you know a few here and there. Uh, so that that would feed the whole press rumor mill that was going on at the time, uh, along with some other very you know simple deception devices, along with having you know your uh, your sources that were journalists or agents in the media that could then keep that that rumor mill going. Now you mentioned that some of the prominent people in the media were famously connected with intelligence sources getting their quote unquote scoops. Oh, absolutely. It's very well documented that uh, some of the leading, uh, I would call them tabloid reporters of the day, like, uh, uh, you know, Winchell and um, as well as uh, Drew Pearson, uh, had very close relationships with the intelligence community. But more importantly than that, you had a large number of newspapers whose editors uh, were very, had very close ties to the, to the intelligence agency because they were staunch anti-communists. You, you know, you have, it's well documented uh, that the editor of the New York Times, for example, had, right. had close ties and in Time magazine. And you look at all of these different folks that were in positions of media power, and they very much had a, a working relationship with the, the folks that were in the intelligence community at the time. And they were, they were more than willing to help uh, in pushing whatever message we want, as long as it was against the Reds. Do we you know. see any of that kind of collusion today, or is the media too scattered no. to work efficiently? No, we don't see any of that today, Gene. Come on. I, I would venture that th- that same relationship continues. Uh, I mean, it's been it's been documented by other folks that it, that there was a close relationship between the media and the CIA after the war into into the you know seventies, and uh, I'm sure there's it's become institutionalized. Exactly. I, I I think it's it's there. It's it's alive. It's it's very much real. You know, one thing that that uh, really caught me by surprise, James, uh, in reading the book was uh, the the amazing effort that went into designing self-destruct mechanisms that would render any sort of recovery process moot when teams would be dispatched to try to recover where witnesses said the rocket went down over there. These things had actual self-destruct mechanisms, at least some of them, which rendered any sort of uh, gathering of intelligence from the remains of these craft uh, or objects. I mean, they... They literally were <laughs> destroying the evidence bef- as they hit the ground. Sure. And th- and I think, uh, you know, a lot of that is uh, technology that they, they, they fine-tuned during the war as part of their deception paraphernalia. Uh, I'm sure, again, I would talk about the simplistic devices they could have created. Uh, you know, they could have shot a, a flare overhead, and it could be interpreted as a, as a rocket. Or they could have had some sort of airframe made out of wood and, and, and with paper wings or wooden wings that so they could have dropped from a large height and let it glide to the ground with a self-destruct mechanism. So there, there was any number of creative ways uh, that they could uh, mask what these devices were. Let's look into motivations here. So we have these reports of ghost rockets. So we're spooking the Russians, right? They think maybe it's something that we're doing or the British are doing. That's one thing. But then we see them here and we think it's the Russians doing it. So that kind of helped inflame the cold war didn't it absolutely in fact i think if you if you read the book from cover to cover what you're going to come what you're going to come to the conclusion is that we we i say the americans and the british we actually fired the opening salvos of the cold war so what was the logic behind that well i think that we knew we, we very much knew that even while the war was going on the russians weren't exactly our allies uh and we got a a, a more grim picture of how much they were becoming our enemy uh, in 1945 when we realized how entrenched their espionage agents were in the United States after uh, a Soviet uh, a crypto clerk defected in Ottawa. And this triggered uh, the, the whole Red Scare of that era. And as we have all these different uh, defectors and these different former Soviet agents coming forward and testifying to the extent of activity, uh, we knew that uh, the Russians were not our friends, at least the Russian leadership were not our friends. And then if you remember back in uh, uh, when th- there was the famous uh, speech about how uh, 
uh, or, or I'm sorry, not the speech, but when, when Stalin came out and during his, uh, one of his five-year plan meetings and said that the, that the East and West simply could not coexist, there, that there was going to be war. It was inevitable between the forces of capitalism and commun- communism. It, it was very much uh, a, a real fear that a, a, another war was headed our way, that World War III was headed our way. There was going to be a big clash, large loss of life, just like during World War II, and something had to be done about it. You know, so it's like almost like the ghost rocket uh, waves were actually formulated to preempt any sort of pacification um, of the American uh, and, and allied populations uh, to, to actually get the, the levels of fear and suspicion you know, jacked up and, and throw gasoline on that fire to then legitimize uh, whatever you know, political stance that the, uh, that the allies would then, would then take uh, as we go into this Cold War period. And it, it seems to have worked. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with your statement there, Chris. It's, it was basically a preemptive action. It was the opening salvo. It was basically, let's portray, uh, you know, this uh, Uncle Joe Stalin as the bad guy. Uh, in fact, he's such a bad guy that he's willing to, you know, fire these these missiles over neutral countries. He's belligerent. He's trying to antagonize us and he's going to start another war. So let's let's beat him to the punch. Let's let's take the propaganda to him. Well, l- let's revisit what to me was very, very intriguing. You know, that encompasses this whole wave of of ghost rockets that were reported, uh, you know, in the northern Mediterranean area. Now, prior to reading your book, I had no idea that the ghost rocket phenomenon extended all the way down to the Mediterranean. Why don't you give our listeners a, a, a thumbnail sketch of of the time frame for these particular sighting reports and also what the possible motivations might have been? And before you do that, let me tell you, we have about 20 seconds left. So maybe we should hold that answer. More information about the ghost rockets, and we're going to want to ask James about some of the implications to early UFO events other than the ghost rockets after. The book is The Rosetta Deception. James Carrion is the author. We'll also bring up some of your questions from our forums at forum.theparacast.com. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Listening to GCN, proudly sponsored by UnseenNow.com. Lock down your digital life at UnseenNow.com. This is GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com Hi, this is Steve Sanchez, and based on a recent study, it was found that 57 million Americans had legal issues over the last 12 months, but only 60% of those studied sought out the services of a lawyer. Why? In a nutshell, affordability. While my friends at Legal Shield have created a solution that can help you not if, but when you need an attorney. For as little as $17 per month, Legal Shield will provide you unlimited access to qualified attorneys at an accomplished law firm for advice and counsel on legal issues, no matter how serious or trivial. For over 40 years and with 1.4 million families across North America, Legal Shield can help you, the loyal GCN listener. Representatives are standing by now to answer your questions, so call them now at 1-855-340-SAVE. That's 1-855-340-7283 or visit them at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Results will vary from case to case.
What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to ProFlowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's ProFlowers.com. Click the mic and enter code P-L-O-W. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? On the Paracast with Gene and Chris, we're talking with James Carrion. The book is The Rosetta Deception. And we're going back and forth on ghost rockets. So is there any more we can talk about there before we go on to other possible events that may have become implicated in the UFO phenomenon. James? Well, the ghost rocket phenomena started off in, in northern Europe, in Scandinavia. Uh, this was the uh, summer of 1946. Uh, but then it migrated down to the south, to the Mediterranean area, uh, when you know there were folks in, in Greece, Turkey, and Portugal all reporting rockets there as well. Um, and what's interesting to me is you can see a direct correlation between where our naval of forces were at. And I'm talking about the, the, the involved deception units were. Uh, Admiral Hewitt and his flotilla of ships uh, were in the right place at the right time when the ghost rockets were flying overhead in Scandinavia. And he, he, those same ships were in the right place at the right time down in the Mediterranean area when, when that was going on in the south. So we can see a, a direct correlation between where these, uh, you know, what I think were former beach jumper units were that were perpetrating this deception, where they were positioned at the time that all this activity was happening. Okay, now, the logical question then is, we created this parent sighting of strange things in the sky. Does any of that relate to the next topic, which of course is ufo sightings what about kenneth arnold did he see something or just some kind of test aircraft honestly i believe that that kenneth arnold was manipulated and used uh in a in a future deception operation when i say future i mean in 1947 uh, but very well, con very much connected to the to the early deception operation 1946. So in the book, I, I call it uh, Rosetta Phase One and Rosetta Phase Two. Rosetta Phase One was what encompasses the book as it is right now. Rosetta Phase Two uh, is is would be more along the lines of what happened during Maury Island, what happened during Arnold, what happened during Roswell. That's the subject of a future book. Uh, but I believe it's all connected. Uh, I think if you read uh, Arnold's own book, uh, The Coming of the Saucers, that if you're open-minded enough and you pay attention to the evidence that he's presenting, there's very much, very, very much an aspect of Cold War espionage that you can see that, that occurs around uh, not only his sighting, but also around his investigation of Maury Island. And again, this goes back to the evidence that most ufologists simply ignore. It doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't have an extraterrestrial connection, so they simply drop it. 
You know, let's take, for example, Kenneth Arnold, when he was investigating uh, Maury Island, uh, he wanted to uh, uh, fly there, for example, to uh, Tacoma. And, um, you know, he got there and he didn't have a place to stay. And it turned out that all the hotels uh, in town were booked. So he started calling around trying to find a room. And when he got to the Winthrop Hotel, uh, the clerk said, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold, we have your room ready for you. He never made the reservation. He gets there and occupies this room he didn't reserve uh, that was under his name. And that's where he's meeting with uh, some other characters related to Maury Island. And all of a sudden, his room is allegedly bugged because information is being leaked to the to the uh, newspapers from somebody who's allegedly hearing their conversations in the room. So there's very much a dark aspect to to uh, Maury Island and Kenneth Arnold that most ufologists will ignore because they don't understand it. They can't make the connection. And this is what I think really goes back to uh, trying to understand, um, you know, what deception's all about. Because if you can't fathom or you cannot conceptualize how you can be deceived, you're simply cannon fodder for these intelligence agencies. And I think that would largely describe most of the leading researchers that are in the field of ufology. Now, in talking about this Rosetta group, you mentioned the first head of the CIA, Rear Admiral Roscoe Henry Hillicotter. Now, when he returned to civilian life, folks, you might remember the name Helen Cotter, okay? Look him up in your history books, but look up also the fact that when he returned to civilian life, he was associated with a friend of his named Major Donald Kehoe, of course, was one of the people who promoted and advanced the early UFO mystery and early UFO research. So Helen Cotter becomes a member of Kehoe's organization, NICAP. Now, through the years, we've always said, that's weird. But isn't it weird, James? Is there a connection between the fact that Hill and Cotter was working with Donald Keogh? <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me, Gene. Sure do. I think uh, definitely there's a connection here. And if uh, in the book, I describe some of the activities that surround Hill and Cotter for a couple of reasons. One, you know, in, in early 1946, even before the ghost rockets started flying over over northern Europe, Hill and Cotter was in charge of the USS Missouri. And he was given a very interesting task. He was to bring back to Turkey the the body of 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 the Turkish ambassador, uh, some some gentleman who passed away that that prior year, and they were going to bring the body back and this great fanfare that they were you know trying to uh, uh, you know uh, basically uh, say to the to the Turks we are friends look what we're doing for you. What it really was about was trying to sh have a show of force in the Mediterranean uh, during the early Cold War, telling the Russians hey stay away from Turkey stay away from Greece. Uh, these are folks that we're very much allied with. Now, what I find very interesting is that when um, when when Hill and Cotter on the, in the USS Missouri was about to enter the Mediterranean, it turned out that he rendezvoused with uh, with Admiral Hewitt's ship uh, outside of Gibraltar, and these two ships were side by side. I think it was like for a day. And even though you know I have no evidence. Uh, my feeling is that there was something that happened when those two ships were docked next to each other. And I think actually what may have been a transfer of either uh, deception or some of the paraphernalia I talked about that triggered the ghost rockets, even some of the loon missiles. There was some exchange of cargo. Again, this is very much hypothetical. I have no evidence to, to, to show. But it's just very curious that right after uh, he would return back to northern Europe and the ship, that then we started seeing all this ghost rocket activity happen. So Hill and Cotter was involved in that from, from that point of view. But Hill and Cotter was also, and, and a lot of folks don't know this, he was the naval attache in France. He was in Paris, uh, you know, even before the, or right after the fall of, uh, of France. Obviously, he wasn't there, but he was very much uh, involved with British intelligence there. He knew this other character named Dunderdale that I, that I said was one of the James Bond models. He had a close relationship with him. Um, and he shows up in all the right places at all the right times, even to the point where right after the, 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 the Rosetta deception took place, lo and behold, he becomes the favorite person to then come back to the States and assume the uh, stewardship of the, of the CIA. He was the first director of the CIA. So there's something going on there where, where he, he, he fell into favor in the intelligence community where he could assume such, a, such an incredible role 
um, in in the intelligence community. So I have a feeling that there's there's definitely a connection there, and and his connection with UFOs later on, I think, is an extension of that. All right, now let me ask you the obvious question here: Are all the UFO sightings that were not possibly the result of the Rosetta deception or some sort of disinformation project? Were they all just conventional objects, or were there real UFOs intermixed with all this? Uh, when you say real UFOs, are, are you meaning uh, UFOs of terrestrial origin or extraterrestrial origin? Let's just say things that have no conventional explanation. Let's not go to extraterrestrial at this point. Just something that we can't explain what's real. Sure. You know, honestly, I, I can't tell you, and I'm not saying that every single UFO sighting in 1946 or 1947 uh, had to be Rosetta or our intelligence community. Uh, you know, who, who knows? There are things out there in the universe we simply can't explain. There are mysteries that we can't explain. All I know is that uh, in such a concentrated uh, t- time frame, uh, we had very strange things going on that to me, fit more a Cold War intelligence operation than than fit uh, any sort of other explanation. Could there have been other things flying around the atmosphere? Sure. I don't what they are. I don't know. Uh, all I know is that uh, what I've been able to research and what I've been able to uncover here uh, sh- shows more of a terrestrial explanation. The book is The Rosetta Deception. James Carrion's got a lot more to tell you, and we'll have some questions from our listeners. Coming up with Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Moms of America, stand up and stop taking abuse from your kids. I pledge never to let my kid disrespect me ever again. I pledge to stop letting my daughter walk all over me. I pledge to stop living in fear of my son's anger. I pledge never to feel like a bad parent ever again. Because I'm not. I pledge to stop letting my child's behavior control my home. I pledge to be a mom with kids who listen. A total transformation mom. I'm Janet Lehman, co-creator of the Total Transformation Program. We created the Total Transformation to help parents with difficult child behavior. Now I'm giving it away free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. We'll let you keep it for free. Call 1-800-256-7795. That's 1-800-256-7795. Call now. Call 1-800-256-7795. That's 1-800-256-7795. Ted Anderson telling you about Jordan Rubin's Beyond Organic Green-Fed Raw Cheddar Artesian Cheese featuring whole milk created through ancient dairy breeding, unpasteurized, untreated whole milk on the same farm the cows graze, containing natural sources of omega-3s, CLA protein, calcium, probiotics, and enzymes. I have never tasted cheese this good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. 
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. At 30dayfoodsupply.com, you can now purchase a one-of-a-kind product not available anywhere else. A meatless burger dry mix in four delicious flavors. With our new Oregon Trail Foods vegan burgers, all you do is add water and fry. They need no refrigeration. They're packaged in Mylar bags with an oxygen absorber for a long shelf life. They're non-GMO. They're gluten, soy, nut, and chemical-free, but they're loaded with flavor. And a good source of carbs and protein, yet low in sodium. Flavors include Italian, spicy mix. Mexican, six vegetable and black bean olive. Go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010 and order today. Eat them every day, take them camping, or save them for an emergency. Check them out at 30dayfoodsupply.com and click on the vegan burger icon. That's 30dayfoodsupply.com where all of our products are produced in Oregon by Oregon Trail Foods. 30dayfoodsupply.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. So we have the first director of the CIA working with NICAP and Donald Kehoe. We have all these events that may or may not have some kind of government disinformation connection. Certainly Maury Island, which we've covered extensively here in the PowerCast. Certainly Kenneth Arnold's sighting may have been something merely conventional, a test aircraft. But you kind of think here, do you think that maybe the UFO mystery got out of control? That once these things started, once these stories were published, it just went to places that maybe the Rosetta Group didn't know? Oh, absolutely. I think it, it mushroomed out of control. And once it did, they really had no way to contain it. So they sort of been uh, just riding along uh, this this wave of, I don't know, how, how would you describe it, but basically just a, a, a intense a, public interest. Exactly. You know, we, what would modern Americana be without? Uh, UFOs or without, you know, a lot of the uh, of the different things that surround UFOs uh, from from the media to, you know, at, um, uh, you know, abductions and all these things that, that surround the, the, the whole field of ufology. But now, really with abductions, it, with abductions, I have speculated that some of the early abductions may have been mind control or drug experiments. I, I would say you're that may very well be. So I think that it may be part of this mushrooming this this inability to contain what started off as a, as a as a myth that was created by by mundane hands i think we can actually see that uh for example even in the ghost rocket period where i think that there were people in the military actually this is well this is documented uh fairly well but there were people in the military that maybe thought i'm talking about the british military that thought that there was something extraordinary to these rockets Again, I'm not saying extraterrestrial, but maybe a technology that was German, very highly advanced. Uh, and, and there was even, R.V. Jones has this very well documented in his book, where he describes where they recovered some fragments of an alleged ghost rocket. And when they sent it off to uh, this British institution to be tested, the British scientists came back very excited saying, oh, we found elements that were unique, you know, that don't exist on Earth. And he said, well, have you tested them to see if they're just regular coal? And they said, oh, we didn't think about organic material. So they turn around and test it and turn out to just be a, a regular lump of coal. So we have, you know, scientists who tended to make these leaps of faith because they wanted to believe that it was something extraordinary. We, we see that, for example, in the modern day UFO era where we have this alleged estimate of the, of the situation that the Air Force created and sent up the channels uh, to General Vandenberg before it was kicked back down and, and burned, saying we think these are extra, of extraterrestrial origin. So these are folks, again, that could have been in the military at the time, but not in on whatever deception was going on. And of course, they can make these leaps of faith and in the, in the, in these you know, grand leaps of fascination. But when it gets up to the person who was in on the deception, being General Vandenberg, 
he's thinking, gee, this really is out of control. I better do something about it. And then kicks it out and says, no, let's take this estimate of the situation. Let's just burn it because it, it, there's really nothing to it. He, of course, he knew that. That's well documented in my book that shows that General Vandenberg, Hoyt Vandenberg, was one of the key deception planners in the post-war era. And that's documented by information I found in the National Archives. Yeah. Well, I, I find it interesting that coal should be found in the uh, remains of a ghost rocket. Maybe it was Santa Claus. He crashed and burned and some of the coal that he was going to deliver to bad kids uh, inadvertently got tested. You know, hey, that's, let, good, that's good as explanation as any there, Chris. <laughs> let's move into another aspect related to this Rosetta deception. Okay. So we're looking here at these early UFO cases that seem to have been generated this way. What about Project Blue Book and the earlier agencies that led to Project Blue Book? Were they done Grudge, deliberately? Grudge and Sign. And Project Sign, Project Grudge. Were they meant to really investigate something they didn't understand or just part of the deception? Maybe they weren't part of the deception at all. Maybe they were just part of the of the of the fact that it had been had mushroomed out of control. We have this large public interest now. What are you going to do? Uh, so you form an agency of folks that are not in on any of this prior knowledge. Let them investigate. It does no harm. You know, where, whereas the folks that are in on the deception can sit back and say, OK, well, let's let's just ha let it happen. So I don't think they were it was really part of the deception. I think it was part of inadvertent. The, uh, yeah, the inadvertent ex explosion of interest that happened in the general population with the subject. It makes perfect sense to me. That, that really has a ring to it. Let me throw another possibility out for you, which actually occurred to me from reading the book and listening to you talk now, James. And that is we have the first head of Project Blue Book, Captain Ruppelt. He writes a book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, becomes a big seller. Then he comes out with a new edition. Now, the first book conveyed the feeling that he believed that UFOs were ET. They have a new edition of the book. Three chapters are added. And famously, in the final chapter, he says, when asked whether he believes in UFOs, if they're real, unusual things or spaceships, he says, I'm positive they're not. And I thought to myself at the time that... Maybe he was pressured. That's the prevailing opinion that he was pressured by his military higher-ups. Or maybe someone went to him and said, listen, Captain Ruppelt, you know, this is getting way too far. This is all based on disinformation, on deception, and someone reads him in on what really happened. And he says, so explain to your readers you don't believe UFOs are real because they take you seriously. Do you think that could have happened? Well, it very well could have happened, but I think based on, on the on the research uh, or my research, I think that uh, if you know, as I believe, this started off as a deception operation. Uh, deception operations at this level, what I call strategic deception, is held very close, very very close. Very small number of people are in on it. So let's take for example, you know, what a lot of ufologists believe in the Majestic documents and Majestic Twelve, and how they've been keeping the UFO secret for years and years, and the big cover up could be. But I don't think it was because of an extraterrestrial crash or Roswell. I think it's because they've been holding of the deception, deception secret it, exactly. And they had to, you have to keep that very close because you have to think that if this ever came out in the, to the public, I mean, I would be very one pissed off public citizen if I knew that the government had been hoodwinking me for the last 70 years, uh, you know, because for, for whatever reason, it doesn't really matter. I mean, let's take, for example, what happened during the Manhattan Project where they built an entire city in the Tennessee Valley Authority. And they didn't tell uh, the vice president, Truman at the time, that they had this project going on. The, 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 the cover-up around that, the secrecy around that, people could understand because it was wartime. But one thing they did very intelligently is after they dropped the atomic bombs on Japan, is they came out with this complete report that said, hey, you know, sorry we did this. We had to do it for wartime secrecy reasons. You know, here's what the atomic bomb is about, blah, blah, blah. They came out and they were honest to the American public. But this is something that mushroomed out of control, and they could not come out and be honest about it early on. It kept getting worse and worse until here we are 70 years later. And, you know, to come out with the truth now that, hey, we, we you know, we pulled the, the, the wool over your eyes and we were the folks that created this myth to begin with. I think they see more cons than pros to doing that. Yeah. I, number one, nobody would believe them because it's become such an entrenched cultural meme that even if they came out and said, hey, it's been all us, 
everyone, you know, within the true believer crowd would think that they're trying to, uh, you know, claim credit for something that uh, everyone has taken for granted as being E.T. Uh, all these decades. Sure. It would be a, a cover up to the cover up, you know, where <laughs> so it was, you know, basically what they say, the whole Project Mogul thing was was about uh, um, around Roswell. You know, we were trying to protect that. So we came out with the story. You know, they're, they're, the true believer is not going to believe it. You're exactly right. Their mind is so made up. Their their belief system so well entrenched. They're simply not going to believe it. And uh, so I think that, you know, the forces that be out there in the intelligence community, they know that. They know that people would rather believe than, than, than actually understand the truth around it. Ah, uh, yes. Let's get back to Roswell. Okay. <laughs> you, you broached the subject. Okay, yes. The, the R word. Not just Rosetta, but Roswell. We have about ooh, a minute or so before we split. So let's just paint the picture and start going from there. So the first news story says, we've found the flying saucer. The second news story says, oh, no, it was just a balloon. And, of course, this kind of buries the Roswell case for a number of years until the late 70s when William Moore and Charles Berlitz and Stan Friedman get involved in researching Roswell. And certainly this entire mythology erupts that still exists to this very day. But the heart of it, can we take the second newspaper story as true? And I'll have your answer in the next segment. Or was it just some kind of secret weapons test or secret aircraft? And they used both stories as a cover story to wipe it off the map for once and for all, at least until people started poking into it a few years later. The book is The Rosetta Deception. And I guess we'll call that part one of the story about this disinformation that leads to UFOs and other things. James Carrion is the author with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. UnseenNow.com, proud sponsor of GCN. Unseen Now's unparalleled encryption tools keep your communications secure. GCN. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Springtime is save big time at Herbal Healer Academy. Long-term customers know spring is the time to stock up at HerbalHealer.com. And for new customers, welcome to the web's best place to save on vitamins, minerals, and more. Log on for spring specials, including our 500 parts per million colloidal silver, all sizes on sale. Choose from Herbal Healer's great variety of weight loss products like apple cider vinegar, Hootia and Metabolic Complex, and Pro Metabolic, all on sale now. Also, the Anti-Parasite Intestinal Freedom and Warwood Plus Complex, plus Stevia Liquid Sweetener and the Super Enzymes, all on sale for spring at HerbalHealer.com. As always, we offer certificate correspondence courses in natural medicine. Enjoy same-day shipping and free online newsletter. Log on now to HerbalHealer.com and click on Spring Specials to save big with our nation's leader in supplying quality natural medicine and education since 1988, Herbal Healer Academy. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Our final four segments of the Paracast with James Carrion, author of Rosetta Deception. So, James, what was Roswell? The first, the second, or the third possibility that it was 
some kind of test aircraft or something? I don't think it was a test aircraft at all. I think it was it was part of of a further a future separate deception operation that happened in 1947, uh, related to the first that happened in 1946. If you read if you read my book, you'll find a very interesting story about an Austrian scientist uh, by the name of Eugene Sanger. And what this gentleman did is he was uh, working on behalf of the Germans during the war. He had developed this concept for what he called the America Bomber. And what this craft was supposed to do was to launch off a sled track uh, that was a couple miles in length. It would basically zoom into the atmosphere. And then when it came down, back down on the ballistic reentry, it would bounce off the atmosphere again and have a further a forward uh, motion. And it could have this, keep having this bounce effect until it reached its destination, which he envisioned as being the United States, where he was going to drop uh, a, a, a basically what was a dirty bomb. And uh, on the uh, on American cities, this was something that was that was uh, very much believed to be possible at the time, even though we now know that it probably wouldn't have worked. But not only the Germans were interested in his research, but the Russians were very much interested as well. So they they actually, after the war, got some of his uh, secret reports. Stalin himself was so enamored of this concept, because remember, he didn't have the bomb at the time. He didn't have an atomic capability. So if he had the ability to bomb American cities uh, with this America bomber, then that was going to be his top priority. So he convened a conference uh, in May of uh, 1947. It just so turns out that, you know, June of 1947, we have all of a sudden this UFO. Remember, back then it wasn't a UFO. It was a flying saucer because it was described as skipping over like, like, a, like a stone on water, which is exactly how the American bomber was described as doing on the atmosphere. So it's just, to me, too convenient that we have, uh, you know, Stalin super interested in this new futuristic weapon that was skipped across the atmosphere like, like a stone skips across water, and all of a sudden we have stories of a, of a flying saucer that exhibits similar behavior. So I think there is the tie-in to the deception, where we are trying to convince the Russians, hey, what you want, we have. And not only do we have it, we're experimenting with it. And that led, for example, I think, to Roswell, led to Maury Island. It was all surrounding trying to convince the Russians we had something they did not. Well, that kind of leads us to one of our listener questions. This one comes from Fedora Chronicles, who posted his question at forum.theparacast.com. Since we're talking about Roswell, he asked, tell us about your thoughts on Roswell. I'm on the fence because I believe the UFO crash could have been a cover-up of a real crash of a flying wedge or wing that the military was testing that was based off technology taken from Germany during Operation Paperclip. Or it was really an alien spacecraft. He wants to know, first of all, which theory do you subscribe to? And I think I, we kind of know where you're going to go with it. But what he wants to know is, do you think that there's a possibility that some sort of secret technology got out of uh, control or out of hand, and then they had to cover that up? I, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. Uh, and I'll tell you wh why uh, I think that that theory, to me, is just complete rubbish. If, let's take, for example, what happened. All right, so we have this alleged crash of, a, of this UFO outside of Roswell, New Mexico. And who blabs to the press? It's the 509th Bomb Group that puts out a press release. That, on its face, is the most ludicrous thing I have ever heard in my life. Because who is the 509th Group? They're the same folks that dropped the bombs on Japan. They're the same folks that, in 1946, drops the, dropped the bomb over Bikini Atoll. These are the folks that were of the highest caliber the most intelligent, the folks that had to be highly trusted because we're dealing with, you know, the, the Manhattan Project and all this atomic weaponry. And they're the folks that are so well indoctrinated in keeping things secret. It makes no sense that they're going to put out a press release if they uncover any technology. That by itself is what actually, I think, more than anything, led me on this journey to try to understand what surrounded Roswell and Kenneth Arnold and Maury Island. Because as a person who, who, who's who been in the military, who's had a top secret clearance, you keep your mouth shut. You, know, you don't go out there and put out a press release if you happen to, if something happened to crash that was of important national security uh, use. You know, you simply don't do that. I have another question here. This one comes from Bonaventure, who's been a uh, longtime poster at forum.theparacast.com. He doesn't come out and ask very many questions, but he came out for you, James. And he wants to know if you think the UFO mystery is largely the creation of the military and the security agencies. 
absent deliberate deception, does any evidence remain that points to an extraterrestrial visitation? Well, I can tell you that uh, my belief is that what the activity surrounded 1946 to 1947 was, was, from my point of view, a strategic deception operation, so definitely involving uh, military intelligence agencies. But then, we, you know, this, that's a very interesting question because this is where we get into the bucket argument. What I call the bucket argument is that people that are believers or that, that truly believe in UFOs and extraterrestrial visitation, they want to have one bucket of evidence. Everything gets thrown into this bucket, right? From the building of the pyramids to the Foo Fighters to Ghost Rockets to Roswell to you name it, it all goes into one large bucket. And if you try to take anything out of that bucket, well, no, 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 you can't because all the other stuff in the bucket means it's extraterrestrial or, or there's, a, you know, there's proof there. And I think that is not the way to approach uh, the subject at all. I think you have to compartmentalize your research. I think you have to focus on uh, your research into certain uh, uh, discrete cases and discrete time frames. And really, you can't just pile up the evidence and say it all makes sense altogether. It simply doesn't. Because I'll be honest and, and tell you that I believe that there's life out there in the universe. I think the possibility of life not being out there, of life not being out there is absolutely nil. Statistically, there is life out there on other planets. The question is, have they arrived here, either today in the near past or in the, in the very you know, uh, distant past? It's very plausible that we had alien visitation way back whenever. Or it could be very plausible we have alien visitation today. So I'm not saying that that's not a, po a possibility. I'm not saying that at all. What I am advocating is that the early days of UFOs, the modern day UFO era, 1946, 1947, that time frame, uh, I don't believe was had anything to do, to do with extraterrestrial visitation. We have another question from Burnt State, who's one of our very active posters at forum.theparacast.com. And first of, first of all, he compliments you on your website uh, and all the great newspaper articles that you've dug up that report on the, the whole ghost rocket phenomenon. But he's very interested to know uh, if you've made contact with UFO Sweden to get access to their many reports and government files pertaining to witness accounts of structured craft and rockets landing in lakes, crashing without debris. And he says that this uh, type of phenomenon continues to this day. What do you think of their findings, and are you aware of their upcoming documentary uh, on the ghost rocket phenomenon? I did come across a, a, their website and, and their discussion of this upcoming documentary, and I have not looked at their archives. In fact, I addressed it in my book. It's one of the areas I would really like to dig more into. Uh, it's been sort of an obstacle based on where the archives are at and, and, and the fact that I know absolutely zero Swedish, so there had to be some sort of translator involved. But what I did find out that I think was very helpful in my research was uh, there was, in, in 1946, one of the ghost rocket sightings that made the, the newspapers all over the world had to do with the alleged collision of a ghost rocket with a military plane, a Swedish military plane, where three Swedish flyers died. Now, this made the newspapers everywhere. And a lot of ufologists point to it, say, oh, it was a real phenomenon. Look what happened. There was this collision. But then what the Swedish researchers from the Swedish UFO organization dug up in government archives is that that crash of that plane had nothing to do with the ghost rockets. It was made up. So part and parcel of this deception I'm talking about. So that gave me some confirmation of that time period. I don't know what goes on today in Sweden, and I, I really can't speculate, but I do know that back during that time frame, there's a lot of eyewitness testimony. There's a lot of uh, alleged testimony around Roswell. And again, this goes back to deception. When you're dealing with deception, right, the fact that you're deceiving the public means that the public's going to report what they see. They're going to be honest about it. That doesn't mean the deception did not occur. It just simply means they're not part, they're not in on the deception. It's the Rosetta Deception, the name of the book. The guest is James Carrion with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, 
They're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. Question, could too many GMO foods and toxins be overloading your digestive and immune systems? Answer, yes. If you're searching for a powerful detox that's gentle enough to use every day, use Pro-EM-1 from Terragonics. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic that uses good bacteria to suppress pathogens and gently eliminate toxins from your body. A healthy digestive system will cleanse and remove toxins, support weight loss, improve absorption of food nutrients, and aid in controlling yeast and other infections. Pro-EM-1 is made with only non-GMO and certified organic ingredients, has no preservatives, and is dairy, soy, wheat, and gluten-free. Pro-EM-1 is the key to your digestive health. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com. Com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X dot com. Or call toll free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Also available through Amazon Prime. Pro EM1 from Terraganics. Life's getting better. If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, proflowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 Blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from ProFlowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers. Picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to proflowers.com. Click the blue microphone in the top right corner and enter code PLOW. That's proflowers.com. Click the mic and enter code PLOW. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Now, just parenthetically, and there's a lot of things to talk about here, James, carry on. I mentioned some of the early abduction cases is possibly being related to tests and mind control or drugs. I mentioned specifically, and we've talked about it before, Barney and Betty Hill. But what about all those other abductions? You know, it's, it's a real good question because it's if I have to say if anything really um, struck me as a mystery when I was uh, head of MUFON, it really had to do with the whole abduction phenomena for a couple of reasons. One, there was there's a lot of uh, evidence, uh, you know, from from the abduction uh, transcription project that MUFON ran where we where we basically partnered up with some uh, hypnotherapists and some counselors so that we could record the, the we could record transcripts of these uh, alleged abductees uh, while they were being hypnotized and understand that there was some commonality in their stories. But I I, I had a, uh, some very close friends that uh, who also claimed to have been abducted, and and they sounded very credible. And they sounded very sincere. So the experience that the experience itself. Uh, seems to be based in sincerity. Where it originates, that I'm not sure. 
I mean, you mentioned mind control. You mentioned possible experiments. We know the CIA was very much involved in, in that type of experimentation. Uh, some folks believe it to be of a, of a religious nature. You know, there are a lot of folks that think it's, if you believe in angels and demons, that it's a demonic activity. So there are a lot of different explanations for it. I don't have an explanation for it. And I don't even have a terrestrial explanation for it, uh, just because I have, have done no uh, research into that area. But I do know that it's very intriguing. Chris? You know, reading the Rosetta Deception and looking at the very careful way that deception operations were conceived and enacted, if you fast forward, you know, 60 years to uh, a particular character that uh, you had um, a bit of dealings with uh, (laughs) fairly recently, uh, Robert Bigelow from Bigelow Aerospace and the Skinwalker Ranch uh, scenario and, of course, the star program or fiasco, I think uh, might be a better uh, term for it. Do you think that the intelligence operations have become so fine-tuned that they can literally run roughshod over any sense of an ET involvement or, you know, use that ET involvement scenario as a cover for very real deceptive practices by the military? All us can walk a ranch, for instance. Absolutely. I, you know, I think that uh, the the large amount of mythology that surrounds Area 51, for example, uh, you know, a lot of that, I think, was originated in the military as, as an operation to just cover up what was really happening in Area 51, which was very mundane in nature. So I think that the intelligence uh, establishment, the, the, the whole intelligence establishment uses the phenomena, uses the mythology, uses the subject to cover up uh, any number of mundane operations. You know, I, f- I found that uh, my involvement with Robert Bigelow and, and the Skinwalker Ranch, the fact that I, you know, I basically paid my own way to go there and was refused entry on the ranch, that lack of transparency uh, tells me that there's something else going on. I'm sorry, this, this, this whole subject is so muddied already. What you don't need is, is, is more cover-up, more deception, uh, more obfuscation. And w- when I started seeing that in the whole MUFON-BASS relationship, that's when I started to question, uh, you know, what's really behind all of that? And, and I voiced my opinions to the board and, and all of history after that because, uh, you know, they went behind my back and, and renegotiated that contract. So the bottom line being that uh, I think this is very well known. If you think you can dance with these intelligence agencies and they don't want you to dance with them, you're never going to dance. The bottom line is there will be a way where you'll end on the out, up on the outside of that. So I think there is a very, uh, very interesting dance happening between ufology and the intelligence organizations that have more to do with what the, the um, um, goals of the intelligence agencies are than a, a cover-up of, of extraterrestrial visitation. So what about MUFON in general? Do you think that an organization is a bunch of sincere civilians trying to find out what's going on or something that's advancing the disinformation? I don't think you can really label it that easily. I think there are folks that genuinely have in the organization that have a genuine interest in knowing the truth. Uh, I think there are folks in the organization that are very much true believers and um, they they discard a lot of evidence presented to them. Uh, I think I'm just, I, I am disillusioned and very much um, have fallen out of favor of MUFON just from the point of view of they've lost their way. Uh, their motto is the scientific investigation of UFOs, and you would be hard pressed to find anything that resembles science in that organization. I think that's reflected in this recent document or these, these shows that they're doing on Discovery Channel. You know, it's, it's almost embarrassing to watch and uh, to see MUFON actually lower themselves to repeating mythology and repeating folklore and repeating outrageous allegations and, and not sticking to what they should be sticking to, which is pure science. I was just going to ask you what you thought of the show Hangar One and, and using very, very tenuous sort of pop culture uh, versions of events, like, uh, for instance, the the whole story of Nixon taking Jackie Gleason down to uh, Florida to show him alien bodies. Well, for the young person, that's, that wants to get involved in ufology really has, uh, you know, altruistic, uh, you know, motivations to get to the bottom of this whole thing. You know, kind of the way I was uh, early on in, in my my life when I looked at these subjects. 
I mean, what do you tell someone like that? How can a, the average person who's getting involved in this for the first time, how can they separate signal from noise? How can they differentiate between deception and what are obviously real events, I think. I think that we're dealing with real events on, on some level. However, I agree with you. There's probably a, a good chance the majority of events that people are experiencing have a very prosaic and mundane explanation. What would you tell a young person getting involved in this morass of a field uh, <laughs> as a neophyte? Well, you, you know, I, I would say based on uh, my years of exposure is don't focus on the signal. Focus on the noise. There's a lot to be learned from the noise. Uh, it's, it's almost, uh, you know, I've said this quite a few times, uh, the absence of evidence is as telling as the presence of evidence. So if you go into, the, into this field with an open mind, you put aside your beliefs, you really look to see why there's so much noise surrounding this field. Pay attention to the noise. Pay attention to the characters that are in the field. Uh, make sure that you check their sources. Make sure you check every single fact. You better be a fact checker, because if you're not a fact checker, you're going to be at the recipient end of disinformation, hoaxes, uh, and just being led down the primrose path uh, that a lot of ufologists find themselves. So the bottom line is, you know, go out there with a sincere desire to, to know truth and to learn truth, no matter how hurtful that truth may be, even if it hurts your own beliefs, you know, look for that truth. Well, the obvious question I think many of our listeners would want uh, Gene or myself to ask you is, are there any cases that are truly unknown uh, that you feel uh, could indicate some sort of presence that is beyond the capabilities of our own military intelligence operative deception, this sort of scenario that we've been talking about. What are your favorite truly high strange cases? You'll answer that in the next segment, I hope. James Carrion joins us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. GCN, proudly sponsored by UnseenNow.com. Find out how to stop Big Brother in his tracks at UnseenNow.com. This is GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many files formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E-Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E-Soft.com. Ouch! My back is out again! Hi, Dr. Ortman with Wellspring Spinal Care. If you're experiencing neck, mid, or lower back pain, this information is for you. One of the complaints that I hear is patients receive their typical adjustment, only having to repeat them as the pain returns. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the battle. At Wellspring Spinal Care, we have the entire solution. We use the NUCA approach, utilizing three-dimensional x-rays and gentle touch technology to deliver specific correction. We then design Design a custom nutritional supplement program which provides essential nutrients targeting the areas of concern. With a NUCA approach and proper nutrition, you'll be on your way to a faster and more permanent recovery. To get you on the road to wellness, visit DrOrtman.com. That's Dr. O-R-T-M-A-N.com. Or call us today, 952-303-9124. That's 952-303-9124. Wellspring Spinal Care. Chiropractic done right. Got a simple question for you. Can you sell? Yes? Okay. Can you sell the intangible? 
If yes, and you'd like to work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, with no overtime, no weekends. If you're passionate about not closing sales, but about opening relationships. If you truly have a desire to serve global clients who need your advertising expertise. And you're local to the Twin Cities and Burnsville, are hardworking, self-driven, with experience in sales, marketing, or advertising, are personable and a whiz on the phone, GCN wants to talk with you right now. GCN, the Genesis Communications Network, is one of the largest largest independent talk radio networks in the world and we're hiring right now we offer benefits and an excellent commission structure experience preferred but we'll train the right person is that you submit your resume today to advertise at gcnlive.com again that's advertise at gcnlive.com come work with the genesis communications network an equal opportunity employer moms of america stand up and stop taking abuse from your kids I pledge never to let my kid disrespect me ever again. I pledge to stop letting my daughter walk all over me. I pledge to stop living in fear of my son's anger. I pledge never to feel like a bad parent ever again. Because I'm not. I pledge to stop letting my child's behavior control my home. I pledge to be a mom with kids who listen. A total transformation mom. I'm Janet Lehman, co-creator of the Total Transformation Program. We created the Total Transformation to help parents with difficult child behavior. Now I'm giving it away free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. We'll let you keep it for free. Call 1-800-256-7795. That's 1-800-256-7795. Call now. Call 1-800-256-7795. That's 1-800-256-7795. Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. The Paracast with Gene and Chris talking to James Carrion. So, high strange cases, James. Do you know of some you want to talk about? Well, I'll have to say that I'm, I can't point to one that's in the historical literature uh, because I haven't personally investigated it. But of the ones I've personally investigated, uh, again, I have to go back to the abduction cases uh, because there was one particular abduction case uh, that I have in mind where to me it was uh, it was very compelling uh, uh, witness testimony. Uh, there was these were folks that had no interest in notoriety, no no interest in it being made public, and and their the way they described the events and the strain the high strangeness of the events uh, just was to me extremely compelling. So again, I'm going back to the abduction cases, and to me these these are the ones that that probably are the, the most intriguing to me. But as far as uh, structured craft. UFO crashes, uh, you know, major sighting events. Uh, there's nothing really that strikes me as as high strangeness because they're historical in nature. Number one, and the ones that I personally investigate well in MUFON it simply didn't pan out. Okay, you say didn't pan out. You went through these cases that seemed the most compelling, and everyone had a conventional explanation, or did you actually find evidence that maybe there was some kind of military disinformation going on? Uh, it mostly had to do with uh, deception. Yeah, there was some level of deception. It, again, this is unknown. I call it unknown deception because I don't know if these folks that perpetrated it had a personal reason for doing it. You know, they just wanted to uh, go out there and perpetrate a hoax. Uh, if there was a money aspect to it or there were maybe an intelligence agency aspect to it. All I know was human involvement and uh, nothing high, highly strange about it. The problem is here, of course, is most of the sightings never really get investigated. And you see a light in the sky or somebody takes a picture of lights and that's it. That's the beginning and end of it. You never go beyond that. So you never know. Well, yeah, I, I would agree with that. But I, I'll have to say something that, I, you know, I think that um, um, a lot of folks in ufology may not like to hear. And that is, you know, I think the bottom line is there, there are folks that are in the field that call themselves ufologists call themselves researchers, investigative journalists, whatever they want to call themselves, it doesn't really matter. But when their modus operandi is to, per, is to perpetuate the mystery instead of solving it, we have a big issue. We have a big problem because the mystery will never get resolved as long as these people are out there um, hawking their latest theories or the latest controversy because, for controversy's sake or their latest witness or their latest, you know, lead investigation, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. 
But if you don't have a sincere interest in truth, you're simply interested in making the rounds of the UFO talk circuit and have your group mystery mongering. Exactly. You're 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 part of the problem, not part of the solution. Well, do you have a short list for us? Uh, any uh, particular Again, individuals that you'd like to uh, single out? Yes, my short list is just pick any UFO conference out there and grab the <laughs> the, the speakers that are there, and that's my short list. Oh my God, no! I I I go out there and speak. Uh oh. That's a broad brush. Chris, do you have something to tell us? <laughs> you God. see, I don't do lectures, so I don't care about this. I actually well, did. No, I don't have anything to, to you know, you know, bring out. I, I mean, I found myself on the, uh, the same DS as some uh, individuals that if I had known they were going to be there, believe me, I would not have uh, agreed to do particular events. But, but I think, yeah, I think James brings up a really good point that, you know, ufology and, and the paranormal now in general, you know, if you look at all the ghost hunter shows and the spinoffs and, and Bigfoot and crypto shows, uh, this has now become an industry. And uh, it's an industry that continually needs to uh, come up with new titillating information, new, uh, you know, claims of uh, events and that sort of thing. And and it, it, you really get on a slippery slope and you're heading downhill real fast if you're as James pointed out, if you're concerned with perpetuating a mystery as opposed to, you know, coming up with some sort of solution or at least a new way of addressing how to research these things properly. I think we've really lost sight of that. And James, uh, you know, it's a point well taken. You know, I'm thinking also here of the case of William Moore. Now, William Moore was instrumental in the early research into Roswell. And then he confesses in this 1989 meeting at MUFON in Las Vegas, that he was working for some government disinformation people. So do you think the whole story here is that Roswell, he was one of the people who helped perpetuate the Roswell myth? You know, I, I think uh, William Moore has a very interesting uh, history and experience. Uh, you know, I, I actually uh, have been privileged to um, look at some of his papers that uh, that um, you know a lot of his research that he left uh, to some ufologists, um, and the, I don't think that he was part of the Roswell deception uh, or even perpetuating that as much as I think he had a sincere interest in finding the truth, but he found himself the same place a lot of ufologists find themselves, and that is cultivating the inside source. And thinking that if they get close to this inside source, this alleged government insider, to their, you know, they're privileged in some way, and one, they can somehow, um, they can win over their insider to tell them what the real truth is. So they, they almost, they're, they're out there fishing uh, for, you know, for something, but at a high cost. And in this case, it was being, you know, actually willingly participating in disinformation campaign. So the problem is that you know you, you try to uh, sell your soul to the devil, as, I'll, as what I'll say, you're going to end up on the losing end every time. You'll, you'll be discredited. Uh, people won't listen to you. They won't look at your research for for what it really is. And I and, and honestly, you know, I feel for William Moore because I really believe that he was a person who really wanted to know what, what was happening out there, and um, you know, just got too close, too close to an insider who used him. Maybe that would be a better way to say it. At least he came out and admitted the fact. Of course, it destroyed his credibility in the UFO field, so it didn't serve anyone's purpose, or did it? I don't think it served. Uh, well, obviously, it didn't, it serve, didn't serve his purpose. That's yes. for sure. Even though a mea culpa is uh, is a lot better than being in permanent denial. Right, I would agree with that. Or, or not even permanent denial, but just pr or just keeping it quiet. Uh, you know, there there are certain things that happen in the UFO field where where people are are doing things they shouldn't be doing, and they're keeping it quiet. And I and I mean, you know, like for example, this involvement with with Bigelow and and Bass. And some of the things that went on around that, you know, those there has to be a, a, a very much a large amount of transparency when when you're going to be uh, involved in something of this nature. You can't hide anything. So, for example, when Bigelow hid the source of his funding and would only reveal it to John Schusler on the move on board, that lack of transparency really rubs me the wrong way. That tells me there's 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 something's being hidden for a certain purpose, and I don't I don't want to be involved in that. 
Right. And John Schusler is also, uh, well, at the time was on the National Institute for Discovery Sciences Board as well. So a little right. bit of a conflict of interest uh, at the very least. Exactly. But it goes back to, you know, uh, when you think you can cultivate the inside source and get somewhere, you really get, end up nowhere. I think the, the, the graveyard of ufology is littered with people uh, who ended up uh, wanting to learn the truth, but in the end, not knowing the truth. Right. Well, one thing I'd like to get into is, is uh, when we come, come back from our break, is your thoughts on the uh, Sherman Ranch or the Skinwalker Ranch case? Um, uh, you know, I really feel that this is an important case. It may be a litmus test for the kinds of deception that you're referring to in the Rosetta Deception, your book. And also, you know, a modern day version, a potential version of that kind of deception. And when we come back, what do you think of that particular scenario up there? Uh, is, is it, you know, as the, the Utes claim, is it some sort of, you know, ancient sort of force that's, uh, you know, at play there? Do you think that Big Low is involved as a cutout organization uh, protecting some sort of military psyops? Do you think that it's a combination of several things? We'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that when we come back. The book is called The Rosetta Deception, and we're moving beyond that. And I kind of think we're helping him and James carry on work on book two. We'll have to ask him about that. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Free from the shackles of corporate America, we're the place for independent thinkers. GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. A sudden change in the wind. The day grows dark as ominous clouds move in and lightning begins to carve arcs in the sky. And you realize you are not prepared. I am telling you to take cover. The number of intense storms is increasing exponentially in the U.S. Tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, and droughts are happening with greater magnitude and frequency. If you are choosing to rely on the government to save you... And no one's coming to help them. You could be dead wrong. The first step towards self-reliance in the face of disaster is a visit to MyPatriotSupply.com. There you'll find the absolute best prices on storable foods, non-GMO seeds, emergency water filtration devices, and so much more. All orders over $49 qualify for free shipping in the lower 48. Visit us online or call 866-229-0927. That's 866-229-0927. And speak to one of our preparedness advisors today. Remember, before it's time to survive, it's time to prepare. MyPatriotSupply.com. At 30dayfoodsupply.com, you can now purchase a one-of-a-kind product not available anywhere else. A meatless burger dry mix in four delicious flavors. With our new Oregon Trail Foods vegan burgers, all you do is add water and fry. They need no refrigeration. They're packaged in Mylar bags with an oxygen absorber for a long shelf life. They're non-GMO. They're gluten, soy, nut, and chemical-free, but they're loaded with flavor. And a good source of carbs and protein, yet low in sodium. Flavors include Italian, spicy Mexican, six vegetable and black bean olive go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010 and order today eat them every day take them camping or save them for an emergency check them out at 30dayfoodsupply.com and click on the vegan burger icon that's 30dayfoodsupply.com where all of our products are produced in oregon by oregon trail foods 30dayfoodsupply.com 
We live in a complicated society. Stressful issues are always popping up. Have you ever been treated unfairly by someone? Have you ever been overcharged for a repair? Have you ever signed a contract or a document worried about identity theft? How many times have you been in those unique situations where you just wanted to call an attorney to find out if you're right or wrong or what your legal rights are? But every time you think about calling an attorney, what do you think about first? That's right. Who do you call and how much will it cost? Our friends at Legal Shield have found a solution. With a nationwide network of 6,900 attorneys who average 19 years of experience, Legal Shield's law firms take over 40,000 calls per week helping their members. For less than $20 per month, you can have access to Legal Shield on everything from the trivial to the traumatic. Let Legal Shield stand up for your rights at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Or call 855-340-SAVE, 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. James Carrion, before we ask you about a possibility of book two here, which seems to me inevitable, it has to come. You have to do it, man. What's your response to what Chris had to say? You know, the Skinwalker Ranch to me is is interesting from a, from a, for a couple reasons. To me, the mythology, I'll call it mythology, because I don't think what's written in the book been, is, is accurate. Uh, this is based on personal investigation when I went there and was denied access to the ranch, and then finding out uh, that the uh, the brother of the original owner of the ranch, before it was sold to Bigelow, was very adamant in saying that uh, nothing paranormal or strange nature happened while his while his brother was owner of the ranch because he and he knows this because he was on the ranch many times. So I think there was a mythology built around that in the same way that a mythology gets built around a number of different cases that end up on the silver screen as a true story. So you know, I really it kind of irks me when I go into a movie theater now and the first the opening scene of the movie it says based on a true story uh, because that tells me that somebody's going to embellish the tale and they're going to sensationalize it and 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 you know sure enough you know you find out years later that the tale was embellished or, or something else was added to it to sell books or sell movies or whatever um, and to me that's what the skin walker ranch uh, really sounds to me based on my personal investigation when I went there uh, and, and did investigation around the ranch and talking to a lot of folks that lived around the ranch there was more alleged strange things going on 20 30 miles away than there was happening on the ranch itself so there's a mythology that was being built up why was it being built up I think it had somewhat to do with uh, you know the, the mythology surrounding area 51 somebody wants to continue that mythology the same way that the mythology is continued around Dulce, New Mexico, and underground bases, and a lot of the stuff that we hear about that really has no substantiation. Just because a billionaire owns a ranch, and a book is out there written by uh, you know folks that allegedly were on the ranch, doesn't make it true. Well, do you want to amplify your uh, your answer? Uh, so, do you think it's all just smoke and mirrors, and there's no truth? to any possible high strange uh, claims of high strange activity there? Um, I can answer that if I, they'll let me take my camper down there and let me stay on the ranch for a week. <laughs> well, one thing I must uh, uh, mention, James, is I did go up to the ranch before the publicity uh, bandwagon uh, kind of set sail. And I really did feel that Terry was very upfront with me. I, I did not get any sense of subterfuge from him. Uh, he seemed legitimately concerned about the safety of his family. And so there was enough there for me to, um, you know, kind of get a sense that there was something very strange going on there. What it was, he didn't know. And, uh, you know, to this day, I don't know. Uh, it's a very complicated scenario. But the Uinta Basin, um, as you pointed out, has a lot of activity going on around the ranch and in the region there, and, and there's documentation that goes back decades. What would be the motivation for some sort of military psyops program vis-a-vis um, -vis using uh, Bigelow and NIDS or Bass as a front cutout sort of organization? What would be the motivation to have the focus uh, being placed on the ranch? 
You know, I'm not sure. I know that uh, there was some discussion of testing of non-lethal weapons there. Uh, that was a, a rumor. I'm not sure how true the rumor is. Uh, but you know, if you can, if there's a if there's a particular weapon that can, uh, you know, stimulate a part of the brain that causes fear, uh, it would be a good way to test it there. Because if you're causing fear, then somebody has something to be afraid of when they read the story. So I don't know. I can't. It's only speculation. I can't really say exactly what's happening, why it's happening, what the motivation is. I really have nothing to offer there. All I know is there's a lack of transparency. And this lack of transparency happened even back when in 2008 when uh, I was involved with the Discovery Channel uh, on doing the show's UFO Over Earth. One of the things I proposed was, let's take the crew and go to the ranch. Let's investigate that. And we were flatly denied by Bigelow. So come on. If, you, if, you, if you're really trying to be transparent about what's happening there and, and to actually support what's happening there, what's wrong with letting a TV crew on there to document it? And, and that was denied. When I went there and, and investigated personally, I was also denied. So the lack of transparency and the claim of personal safety and all this, I don't buy it. All I know is that somebody's obfuscating what's really going on, and I don't think it has to do with with protecting people's lives. I think it has something else to do. Well, do you think that it, it could possibly be sort of a red herring? Watch the right hand while the real stuff is going on, maybe in the region, but elsewhere? Uh, well, absolutely. I think one of the things that really struck me was uh, talking to somebody who's been on the ranch a number of times, you know, the, 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 that there was a discovery of these metal rods on the ranch, and then this gentleman was told by a NIDS scientist, Bigelow's organization, that they were they were element 114 rods, you know, which ties into the whole uh, Area 51 story. And, and 114 and 115, I've, I've heard both. Uh, actually, I can't remember. I, whatever it was, whatever was was allegedly discovered by, uh, Bob, or, or seen by Bob Lazar at, uh, at Area 51. Yeah, that's 115. Junior Hicks was the one that uh, I think was the one that kind of, you know, was involved with the... Uh, discovery of that particular rod which i heard was uh equated to a tractor part <laughs> well but but he was being told that it was element 115 right so somebody wanted him to believe that there was something highly strange about those rods and where does that tie back into it ties back into area 51 it ties back right. into bob lazar it ties back into the mythology right so why does there have to be a tie into the mythology if there's real activity going on in the ranch a good point. In, in in terms of accuracy, Hunt for the Skinwalker had one glaring inaccuracy uh, in, in relation to that particular event where the dogs chased off after uh, one of these blue softball sized uh, you know, balls of light. And then, you know, subsequently the following morning, uh, Terry went out there and found you know, grease piles, as he put it. Uh, when I read it in the book, the date was off by nine months. I was literally on the phone with Terry when that event occurred, when the dogs chased off. And he said, I have to get off the phone and try to try to get my dogs to come back. And the next morning, I found out that that he discovered them and his emotion was genuine in his voice. Those dogs were melted into piles of grease in terms of my interpretation of his emotional uh, you know, bearing when he told me this the following morning. But in the book. You know, I mean, he had it happen, you know, nine months prior to that. Uh, so you can't judge a book by its cover and you can't judge the contents of the book uh, in some sense of the word. But I think it's I think we can judge lack of transparency. That's true. Yeah, that's that's always a uh, a real, um, I think, important indicator. James, we're just about out of time. Let me ask you very quickly here. If our listeners want to know more about the things you're doing. Is there a site they can go to or a place they can write you? Uh, absolutely. I have a blog. It's called rosettadeception.blogspot.com. Uh, you can also go to my Follow the Magic Thread uh, blog, and there's a link to it from there. And what I'm doing is I'm actually taking uh, all of the footnotes that are in the book, uh, and I'm posting all the associated uh, documents that I've uncovered uh, so these are things out of books, uh, out of the National Archives. I actually live in the in the Virginia area right now, so uh, I can get to the archives fairly easily now. And uh, my research isn't over. There's a lot more research to be done. Uh, and as you alluded to earlier, there will be a second book coming out. Tentatively, uh, will be uh, titled the uh, Roswell Deception. Oh, all right. Dum dee dum dum. We're going to want to have you back for that one. That's going to be certainly fascinating. Oh, yeah. 
taking it to the next logical step. We can take Chris O'Brien to his next logical step because he has a site called OurStrangePlanet.com, OurStrangePlanet.com. And as we've mentioned before, his latest book is Stalking the Herd. If you want a copy, yes, you can go to Amazon. But if you go to Chris's site to buy the book, he keeps all the money. You know, Amazon, you know, Jeff Bezos is a cheapskate. That's why he's so rich. You know, Of course, I'll never get a book on Amazon after saying that. But seriously speaking, he will sign the book and he'll number the book, OurStrangePlanet.com. You can check us out on Twitter, where we are known as The Paracast. We are The Paracast on Twitter. We're on Facebook as The Paracast Fan Club. There are two of them, and nobody knows how to make them into one fan club without killing some of the information. If there's an expert out there, let us know about it. Or check our site, thepowercast.com, where you can download every single episode of The Powercast, either in one session or many sessions. James Carrion, thanks for joining us on The Powercast. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Chris. The Powercast. Featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.